Hello, and welcome to Stories from India, a podcast where we talk about myths, legends, and folk tales from India. I'm your host, Narad Muni, and I'm a mythological character myself. I was given the gift of eternal life and knowledge of the past, the present, and the future. By profession, I'm a traveling musician and a storyteller. So the way I'm doing my job is by podcast. During each episode, we'll be talking about a story from Indian mythology, followed by a character of the week segment. A quick note before we start today's show. This episode features a betal. A betal is a creature that has often been approximated to a vampire. This is probably okay in the context of today's show, but I'll mention some differences between betals and vampires at the end. This week, we'll see why when someone gifts you a fruit, it's best to eat it right away instead of storing it. We'll also learn how betals are great at creating lateral thinking puzzles. We'll also hear the story that may have inspired the Princess and the Peace story from Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales. King Vikram Aditya was a great king from about 2500 years ago. How he got to be a king is not so great, however. When he was a prince and second in line to his father's throne, in a move that might be straight out of the godfather, he had his older brother killed. He used a poisonous scorpion, according to one source, a very painful way to die instead of a quick death. Despite the nasty backstory, Vikramaditya, whom I'm just going to call Vik, proved to be a fair king and he ruled with great wisdom. Wick held court every day, listened to the problems of his people and did everything he could to fix them. I mean, fix the problems, not fix the people. One day, a wise man came to his court. Now, wise men or rishis were treated with great respect and kings would move mountains to grant their smallest wish. A typical rishi would go to a king's court, be well received, eat good food and drink, sleep well for a few days and then leave. The payoff to the king would be that the rishi would make a prediction, or if he had some special power-ups, he would even grant a wish. The predictions were almost always vague and were meant for some time in the future when the rishi was safely away from the scene. The wishes were usually vague enough that it would be impossible to rule out magic wish fulfillment. So it was a pretty good deal, a win-win for all involved. Now, the rishi who came to court today first ran into the royal secretary. Do you have an appointment? the secretary asked. I don't, said the rishi. You'll have to take a token and wait your turn. Meanwhile, you can fill in this form. Check here and here for your dietary requirements, how long you'll be staying, and most importantly, check here to indicate your specialty. Wish, prediction, or other. Please describe. Fill in the form and we'll get back to you with a decision in a day or two. Sorry to make you do all this, but we had a couple of freeloaders last month. They skipped out on us without so much as a thank you. I don't think they were real rishis. I spotted them right away. Their robes were all wrong. But who was going to believe me? Anyway, that's why we have this process now. Are you trying to say something? He asked the rishi. The rishi, who had been trying to interrupt, said, Yes, if I could just have a minute. I just want to give the king a gift. The secretary almost dropped his clipboard in amazement and then slowly said, You're passing on the palace day and the food and the wine and you want to give the king a gift anyway? No quid pro quo? Yes, that's right, said the rishi. Oh my god, this is one for the record books, said the secretary. I'm going to tell my grandchildren all about this. Mac, hold the queue, he shouted, just as another rishi was about to be let into the courtroom after a two-day wait. We got to fast track this guy, said the secretary, indicating the rishi. The rishi walked in and the king and everyone else bowed because that's how rishis and kings worked back then. The rishi, without a word, presented the gift to the king. 
a mango. It was ripe. Mm, thanks, said the king, but the rishi was already walking out. The king didn't want to eat the mango, so he gave it to his treasurer. Because who doesn't keep perishable fruit mixed in with their money? And nothing further was said about it. The next day, the rishi was back. Change your mind about the food? asked the secretary. But no, the rishi wanted to give the king another gift. It was another mango. And again, pretty much the same thing happened. And again, the mango went to the treasury. This happened for a number of days, until one day, the king was in his garden when the rishi arrived and presented the mango of the day. After he had left, the king was actually finally tempted to eat it. His minister, who was a bit paranoid, advised him not to. It could be poisoned, he warned. The king didn't seem to think much of the idea. It's a raw mango with the skin on. How could it be poisoned? He asked the minister. Snow White's mother did it, said his minister. You do have a point, said the king. Conveniently, there's this monkey in the garden I can't stand. He tossed the mango at the monkey. The monkey picked up the mango and started eating it. And soon it finished eating it and tossed away the seed. Except it wasn't a seed. It was a large ruby, very shiny and very real. The royal jeweler examined it and declared it to be the most valuable gem he had ever seen. The surprised king immediately called the treasurer and asked for the rest of the mangoes. The treasurer, who hadn't been in the garden, was only too happy. He had been wondering if by asking him to store the mangoes, the king was subtly hinting that he was planning to demote him to the position of royal grocer or something. Every mango was sliced up, and every one of them contained a huge precious jewel. We've hit the jackpot, exclaimed the treasurer. Indeed, said the king, but we must distribute the extra wealth to the people. And I must speak to the rishi tomorrow when he arrives again. No, 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 said the treasurer. You can't do that. What if he stops? He's like the goose with the golden egg. We should keep receiving the eggs and not ask any more questions. I can't in my good conscience do that. I can't accept anything of value from people without knowing their motives, said the king. He had a point, of course. So when the rishi arrived the next day, the king bowed before him and asked what he could do for the rishi in exchange for the generous gifts. The rishi said, I have only one request for you, king. On the next new moon night, you must come to the crematorium. I will wait for you there and give you further instruction. The king readily agreed. While in the background, the secretary shook his head and thought to himself, quid pro quo after all. And on the appointed night, the king arrived and saw the rishi. The rishi had started a little fire and was chanting some prayers. He paused and instructed the king to go fetch him a betal from the banyan tree on the other side of the crematorium. A betal is a reanimated corpse that loves to hang upside down on trees like a bat. The king quickly reached the tree and managed to catch one without much difficulty. But within minutes, the betal managed to escape and go back to his tree. This happened a few times until the king realized that the betal only managed to escape the moment the king said something. The king's voice made the betal less solid briefly and allowed him to escape. Since I have universal knowledge, I could try to explain the mechanics behind how that works, but you wouldn't understand it, because some of the underlying science hasn't been discovered yet. 
Maybe in the 25th century, when I'm telling this story to a different audience, I might throw in those details. So anyway, on the next iteration of Capture the Flag, I mean Capture the Betal, the king did not speak a word. But the Betal spoke to him instead. He said, we have a long way to go. No, we don't, thought the king, but he wouldn't say it because the king thought the Betal was just trying to trick him into saying something so that he could escape back to his tree. The Betal continued, To pass the time, let me tell you a story. And this is the story that follows. Once upon a time, said Betal, there were three holy men, three rishis. They were known to be very fastidious, which means they were fussy and paid great attention to very minor details. They wandered about the land, palace hopping like many rishis back then. Once, at the palace of a famous king, the first rishi showed up. He was received warmly and even sat at the king's own table for dinner. And the food was rich, at least, the king himself had never any cause for complaint. However, after the very first bite, the rishi was offended. I refuse to eat rice that is grown from ash, he said. Everyone was surprised that the rishi could discern something like that from one bite of the rice. The king immediately launched an investigation. It was soon discovered that the rice did indeed grow in a field right next to a crematorium. Speaking from my unlimited knowledge, I can positively assert that there is no nutritional difference between rice grown near a crematorium and rice grown further away. But psychologically, there was a huge difference. The king ordered a change of supplier right away. The rishi left, and after a while, the second rishi showed up at the same palace. He too was warmly received. As he was being served food and drink, he remarked to the serving girl that she must have drunk a lot of goat's milk. I didn't, said the girl, afraid now because the king might think she had been drinking out of his stock. The king was curious and had someone investigate. No, the serving girl never drank goat's milk from the king's supplies, said the investigators. But we talked to her mother. In the girl's childhood, she fed almost exclusively on goat's milk, a fact that the girl herself didn't recall. Again, everyone was amazed by this rishi's powers. He left after a while, and then the third rishi showed up. He too was warmly received, but this time, dinner passed by without incident. When it was bedtime, the rishi was shown to his room, and he had a great big luxurious bed with seven mattresses. The maid had just laid out brand new sheets for him and everything. The next morning, the king, like the good host that he was, stopped by to ask if the rishi had slept well. The rishi said no he hadn't and showed him a big red mark on his back. Again, the matter was investigated and it was discovered that under the seven mattresses there was a single human hair. The shape and length of the hair exactly matched that of the mark on the rishi's back. The king apologized for the discomfort and the rishi went on his way. That's the story, said the Betal. All three rishis were sensitive to some sort of stimulus. The taste of the rice, the smell from the serving girl's hands, and the presence of the hair. Now, Vic, can you tell me with certainty which of the three rishis was the most sensitive? I have already said a number of times that Vic was smart. 
and here he proves it. The third one said Vic right away. The first two rishis could have gotten their information about the rice and the serving girls some other way too. Not necessarily from tasting the food or from the smell of the girl's hands. But the third one had a visible physical effect on him. So I'd put my money on him. Bingo, said the Betal. Your answer is right. But also, you spoke. So now I'm off. And the Betal flew off back to his tree. We'll leave it here this week. The king did go back and grab the Betal again and again and heard more stories, but those are for future episodes. A few notes on the show. A Betal is not a vampire. A vampire is a fictional character that was mostly made famous by Bram Stoker's Dracula. A Betal is a corpse that can fly and talk and tell stories and listen to some extent. It's not a zombie either. It mostly hangs out or rather hangs down from trees near cemeteries. Wick and the Betal do this a number of times. 25 in the most common versions, but more or less in some other retellings. The Rishi and King relationship is an interesting one. It is rooted in caste division in ancient Indian society. There are a few different terms, Rishi, Sadhu, Sanyasi, Jogi, but it's easy to think of them simply as wise men, though they may not always act wisely. The character this week is a legend. King Porus ruled parts of the Punjab region of the Indian subcontinent around 3rd century BC. He was a great warrior and is often depicted riding an elephant. When a huge army arrived from the northwest, Porus did his best to defend his land. Since the army was that of one of the greatest conquerors of all time, Porus's best was not good enough. Alexander the Great soon had him in chains. When Porus was brought before him, he could see a marked difference between Porus and all of the other kings Alexander had defeated. Seeing his proud and dignified stance, Alexander asked Porus how he would like to be treated. Porus answered that he would like to be treated no different than how Alexander himself expected to be treated. This impressed Alexander so much that not only did he let Porus go, he even gave him some of his land back. Today, this incident is what Porus is mostly known for. Next week, we'll start on the Ramayana. This is one of the two greatest epics of Indian mythology, and I'm so excited to start this. The character next week is a girl who abducted a prince so she wouldn't have to marry his cousin. Since I'm several thousands of years old, my memory may not be perfect at times. So if you see any errors in my podcast, I'd appreciate it if you could point them out to me. If you have any comments or suggestions, you can leave a review on the site. It's sfipodcast.com. The site is also linked in the show notes. You can also tweet at sfipodcast. The music is from purpleplanet.com. That's purple-planet.com. As always, I'm grateful to family and friends for all the support and help. And thank you all for listening. The feedback I have received has been very useful. I'll see you next week.